Imagine you had the power to visit yourself in the future. Wow. Nice boat. We win a lottery or something? No, we just took some advice. If you're still working and of a certain age, you may remember that Freedom 55 marketing campaign in the 80s that promised years of happy leisure through early retirement. To you, it's a dream. To us, it's a matter of how and when. Talk to a Freedom 55 financial security advisor about your financial... But with people living longer and pension systems running short, it may be time for a more realistic slogan. Work longer, save more, and expect less. And I think that's unfortunately where we stand. And planning for retirement has also become more complicated as people increasingly have to figure it out by themselves. It used to be there were institutions like your employer who would manage your retirement account for you. But since people can now go directly through their apps to borrow money or um, invest or what have you, it's becoming much easier to be bamboozled and even defrauded. I'm Olivia Mitchell. I'm a professor of risk management and insurance, as well as economics and public policy at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Olivia Mitchell wrote the book on retirement, well, books actually, and has spent her career helping people make better financial decisions. She sat down with journalist Rhoda Metcalf to talk about the challenges of today's economy for Americans planning their so-called golden years. For people heading into retirement today, what's their situation like compared to past generations? 30, 40 years ago, at least in the U.S., my parents' generation, for example, faced a pretty positive economy. They had what they believed to be a very strong retiring medical program under Medicare, a very strong social security system. And many of them were fortunate to experience a big run-up in housing prices. So when they reached retirement, they were doing relatively well. Right. Today's retirees are not necessarily in such great shape. They face a longer lifespan. Many of them can work longer. There are a lot of silver linings, shall we say. On the other hand, we know that not only the U.S., but many countries around the world are facing falling fertility and rising longevity. Right. So what that means is that we're going to be a much more rapidly aging population. We know that Social Security, which is the uh, first pillar, the first tier of retirement security in the U.S. is going to run short within 10 years by 2034, at which point benefits will have to be cut by 30 percent for everyone, or taxes, payroll taxes, will have to go up by about 60 percent. Hmm. But unfortunately, our politicians seem amazingly unable to fix that problem. So you're saying the situation right now isn't too bad, but in 10 years, 10, 15 years from now, we're going to hit a real crunch. Well, that's absolutely right. The reality is that uh, longevity comes with it, this silver dividend. We get to live longer. Many of us will live healthier. But families and society will have to care for a larger number of frail elderly. So it's been opined that economic growth around the world will slow as older folks start to draw down their assets. And there will be a global balance of power shift away from what has traditionally been thought of as the rich developed old economies Mm -hmm. and more toward the emerging world. And all these are really uh, revolutionary changes that we've not experienced before. Right. And playing into this as well, I guess, is the fact that the world of work, the way we work now, has really changed, right? So, I mean, how does that play into retirement? There have been a huge number of changes in the workplace, not just because of COVID and the advent of working from home, 
It used to be that the government took a much bigger role in your retirement system design. Right. Employers would get much more involved in terms of offering defined benefit plans. That trend, not only in the U.S., but around the world, has changed. As the workforce has changed and people move between one employer and another, the idea of having a pension where you have to remain for life with a given job or with a given company just doesn't meet the needs anymore. Right. So people are much more on their own when it comes to planning their retirement. Uh, I know that a big part of your research has been a study that you did that really looked at how well people are doing in retirement. Can you tell us about that? So I had been working with a very eminent group of researchers doing a project that has become known as the Health and Retirement Study. We began in 1992. We started surveying people aged 50 and over, and then we followed them every two years until they pass away. And with their permission, we've merged in Social Security earnings records, benefit records, also medical records. So it's this incredibly rich database that allows us to follow people as they move into their 50s and beyond. Wow. And what we found was that a goodly number of older individuals had never planned for retirement, had never saved for retirement, um, were not very well versed as to how long they might live, not only their life expectancy, but the longevity risk they faced, which has to do with the chances of living to 100 or 110 or 120 years old. So if you don't understand the tail risk of potentially living a very long time, then you're probably unlikely to save enough. You might be likely to retire too soon. Right. And so one of the things I've been working on lately is trying to inform people to better educate them on that tail risk and then see if that induces them to start taking better precautions. And I, and I know that in that study, you also found that people generally are not very financially literate, right? I mean, they don't understand their own personal finances very well. And women in particular are very vulnerable to becoming poor in retirement. Why is that? Well, we know around the world, in most countries, unfortunately, that women earn less than men. They have breaks in their labor market careers for child raising or increasingly for taking care of elderly family members. They spend more time in unpaid and part-time work. And as a result of all those factors, they accumulate less retirement wealth. They also tend to traditionally marry men older than they, and they tend to retire when their older husbands retire. Right. On top of which, they live about six years longer right. on average. So the chances are very good that women, even if they've been partnered along the way, will have to live uh, maybe 15, 20 years alone. And they may not have prepared sufficiently to cover all those possibilities. So the pension gaps are big and... Women are not only less financially knowledgeable, but they're more likely to say, I don't know, when, hmm. in other words, the men tend that we survey tend to give a wrong answer, but they're very confident about it, right. whereas the women understand they don't know, and so potentially there's more room for teaching them more about their finances. But the shortfalls in Social Security and potentially Medicare will be very painful for women in particular. And also, I think uh, I, I've read women sometimes leave the, the whole financial planning to their husbands, right? They, they are not even sort of involved in that. Yes, I teach a course to my undergraduate students called um, Consumer Financial Decision Making. And I say to them right up front, you know, don't give up all the purse strings because this is something you will regret later. Right. Um, we do observe, interestingly, that 
in married couples, the male typically takes charge of the family's finances. Right. But since we follow people through to the end, and we can see that women's financial literacy increases the closer it is to the husband's demise. So it's not that they can't learn or they won't learn. They have to learn. Yeah. But in many cases, it would be better if they started earlier. Right, because then they can choose to make perhaps different decisions earlier on. Absolutely right. Right, right. I understand that your research actually has influenced the way Social Security, the Social Security Department in the U.S. lays out the options for people for taking their benefits. Is that true? I've done a lot of work on Social Security over my career. In fact, I was on the um, uh, Bush Social Security Commission back in um, 2000. One, right. we've also done some work on trying to understand how people think about Social Security. So the, the reality is if you um, claim at age 62 in the U.S., there's a benefit cut because right. you're going to be taking the money longer. If you wait until you're 70 to take your benefit, then your benefits increase by 75%. Wow, yeah. So it's a huge bump up in benefits. But nonetheless, financial advisors tend to say things like, well, if you don't take the benefits at 62, you might die. And then you might not break even in terms of the benefit to you of waiting. And it turns out that presentation urges and encourages everybody to take the benefit early. So, uh, and have you been able to break into that at all? I mean, change that approach? So a few years ago, the Social Security system, the administration, said they were going to move away from this break-even approach, which I think is to the good because many people can and should work longer. Um, there was a bit of a revolt amongst the field agents because the field agents, it turned out, were getting work points, in other words, compensated if an individual came in and claimed the benefits right away instead of delaying. I see. Um, but I think it is getting through. Right. And now, of course, we face the reality that with benefits having to be cut potentially 30 percent, my view is it's much better to, if you have to have a cut, to have a cut from a higher base yeah. rather than from a lower base. So I think that message is getting through as well. You know, it, it's interesting. Um, the theme of women comes up a lot in your work. You know, I'm interested to know what it was like for you back when you first started to study economics in the 70s as a, as a woman at a time when women were a, a pretty small minority, right? I mean, what was it like? Well, out of full disclosure, I should reveal that both of my parents were trained as economists. Right. So I was probably doomed from the start. <laughs> But I remember when I was about five years old, we lived in Karachi, Pakistan, and I was struck by the construction techniques where people would pass a bowl of cement from one person to another up the side of the building. Then they dump the bowl of cement and take it down. And I said to my dad, why are they doing that? Why don't they have, you know, tractors or heavy machinery? And he said, labor is cheaper than capital. So from the very beginning, I was already um, focused on economics You're and You're being markets. trained up at a young age. Exactly. <laughs> um, but I do remember when I started college, I was thinking about different majors, but really the only one I liked was um, economics. When I went to my very first uh, conference, I came in a bit late and I was at the back of the room and it was a long, narrow, skinny room. So the gentleman presenting was up front and um, during the question and answer period, I had a question. So, and I'm not the tallest of people. So right. I stood up at the back of the room and raised my hand. And I had 99 male faces turn around and right. stare at me. Oh my God. And I took a deep breath and then I proceeded asking my question. And that was just kind of a, a moment of realization that, oh, yeah. That's the way it is. Okay, fine. Now it's much better. Right. It's more evenly divided. Of course, it still depends on subfields. Mm -hmm. But we also, in the American Economic Association, have um, an ombudsperson that's very helpful, especially for junior women that need advice and counseling, sometimes around sexual harassment right. topics. Um, so things are, are much better than they used to be. 
What brought you to the focus on pensions and retirement? Because I think you started in that direction fairly early in your career, right? Well, indeed. I finished my PhD and started teaching at the time at Cornell University. And my department chair told me I had to teach a course on pensions. I was 25 years old. I couldn't tell a pension from a panda. So I started reading the textbook, which was an arcane actuarial tome about mortality predictions and so on. And I was falling asleep reading it. And I thought, gee, I think there's some more interesting questions here. So bit by bit, I began doing research on the topic. And the rest is history. Right. I, but I had read that your mother had some influence on your direction as well. Is that not so? That's absolutely right. So when I finished my PhD dissertation, that was primarily an econometric study. So I looked around for a new topic and asked all my, my colleagues. And my mother, who was also trained in economics, said, aging, that's the, <laughs> the new field. And by golly, she was right. Absolutely right. It's because everything about pensions and aging and financial economics, it, it's a, a microcosm of mm-hmm. everything. So there's finance and there's behavioral and there's psychology and there's right. obviously, you know, tax policy and so forth. Um, it's a very and social rich. policy. It's a rich field. Right. And I would highly encourage others to look into it if they're looking around for a topic. Do you think that it's easier, that it's a lot easier for women in economics now in terms of, you know, that whole work-life balance? Because I know that when you first started, you very quickly found yourself in that situation of having children and also having the career to deal with. Was it difficult at that time? I was the only woman in my department, and I was the only woman that had ever given birth. And uh, there was no policy manual. So after that, I had to help write the policy manual, of course, of right. what maternity leave looks like and so on. Fortunately, um, at Cornell, they had a child care center, which, of course, I had to then become the president of and raise a million dollars to build a building and <laughs> right. so on. But I do think it's easier. I think now there are policies which both moms and dads can take advantage of to be able to um, plan their teaching and their research and take a year off and so on. It's still not easy, and kids still get sick all the time, which is was a, a big shock to me. <laughs> yeah. But um, all in all, I think that there are more institutional supports than there were 20, 30 years ago. So, I mean, on this this issue of financial literacy, which I know has been a, a, a big focus in your work, are we seeing more options for people to become more financially literate? I mean, is this is this improving, do you think, in our society? Increasingly now in the U.S., 21 states now mandate financial literacy in high school. Okay. And you can show that the young adults that grow up exposed to that financial literacy are much better uh, later at planning ahead, budgeting, saving for retirement, and so forth. So it can have a lifelong impact. Right now, the topic of great interest, at least here in the U.S., is um, student loans. Right. And kids get into these loans and their parents as well without knowing what they're doing. And something like 6% of elderly folks are having their social security checks cut in order to pay back the student loans wow. that they took out for themselves or their children or grandchildren. Wow. Yeah. And, and the thing is, it's quite predatory, right? I mean, there's so many companies that are trying to draw you into the prospect of taking more credit. And if you don't have the defenses of understanding the finances, you're so much more vulnerable to being drawn into that, right? And I worry about it quite a bit, especially for the younger generation now that is um, increasingly focused on apps on their yeah. phones. And it's so easy to get involved in investments and cryptocurrency and all kinds of things that people are hugely underinformed on and can end up losing a lot of money. It used to be there were individuals or um, institutions like your employer who would manage your retirement account for you right. or your broker who would help you invest in the stock market. But since people can now go directly through their apps 
to borrow money or um, invest or what have you. It's becoming much easier to be bamboozled and even defrauded. Mm. So this is something that we worry a lot about with the older population, where fraud is bounting. Yeah. So um, what steps do you think people should take to make sure they don't run out of money in their retirement and, you know, and are sort of anxiety-free for the many, possibly many decades of their retirement? Well, I've I'd like to quote a woman, uh, Lady Barbara Judge, who is a Penn alum who was running the British pension insurance system. And she had a mantra, which I've adopted as my own. It's work longer, save more, and expect less. (laughs) And I think that's unfortunately where we stand. If you are healthy enough to keep working, I'd say keep working as long as you can. Try to find uh, maybe a part-time job. Try to find one of the most dangerous uh, situations with the elderly is loneliness. Right. And so it doesn't even necessarily have to be a financially highly compensated job, but just one where you're doing something worthwhile. You stay engaged. And you stay engaged and you have something to contribute. Will you be taking your own advice when it comes to retirement? Are you planning to hold off as long as possible? Yes. <laughs> I don't know how long that will be. Um, my husband retired uh, 10 years ago to become an ultra marathon runner. Oh, my God. So he runs 300 miles, 200 miles all around the world. Wow. And <laughs> I figure as long as he's running, I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. To become a, a marathon runner... In his 60s. In his 60s. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's crazy. Does he ever try and get you out running? Uh, I did before I had kids. Right. Um, we tend to do things like scuba dive instead. Yeah, it's lower impact. Definitely. Well, Olivia Mitchell, what a fascinating interview we've had today. And I thank you for taking the time to speak with us on the program. My pleasure. Absolutely. Olivia Mitchell is a professor of economics and public policy at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. She was speaking with Rhoda Metcalf. Mitchell is also the author of several books on the topic, including Reimagining Pensions, The Next 40 Years. Check it out wherever you get your books and look for the other podcasts in our Women in Economic series wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on X, what used to be Twitter, at IMF underscore podcast. I'm Bruce Edwards. And I'm Rhoda Metcalf. Thanks for listening. <laughs>